Hello and welcome to Audio Talk. Today we have Clayton Shaw, Spatial Audio's founder and chief speaker designer. I've had the pleasure to purchase and review Spatial Audio's X3 Open Baffle Loudspeaker System. It's a pleasure to have you on Audio Talk today, Clayton. How are you doing? Doing great. How's it going? All right, good. Hey, before I ask you about the X3s, can we get to know you a little bit and can you share some of your background? Uh, sure. I may be kind of, you could say, typical of a lot of speaker designers where they have this story about when I was 12, you know, my dad had a hi fi system. And, uh, and, and that's really very much kind of the way I, I grew up um, back in the 60s. Uh, my dad and, well, my mom was a music teacher and my sister was a, you know, actually hardcore serious pianist and uh, taught, you know, in Hong Kong and stuff like that. So I, every morning at six o'clock in the morning, you know, I'm listening to a Steinway Baby Grand. I wake up to that, which I, I didn't like at the time, but I think that actually may be a really important factor because I know exactly what a piano sounds like. And, and when we're working with speaker development, um, that to me is, I mean, obviously the human voice uh, is difficult also but i think the piano is the most useful because it covers about 10 octaves and it's has a lot of harmonic content and, um, and dynamic range and so forth so i think that's been really helpful but yeah so through those years of you know so i was really into that um hi-fi and really just got totally absorbed in it like a lot of probably our listeners i mean uh, if you go back to that time period when high fidelity was a big deal and sort of accidentally, uh, a neighbor had some uh, Macintosh vacuum tube amplifiers and the Magapan Timpani 1C, which was a real early uh, three-screen, folding-screen speaker that you guys might remember. Um, that it had some issues and everything, but it had that it had a, a feeling that that you were you know in a symphonic environment instead of feeling like speakers were just shooting at you. You felt like you were immersed inside of the experience. And I think that had a huge effect. And that, that was maybe when I was, you know, in high school, maybe 15 years old or something along those lines. So um, I had some, I think, good and lucky kind of uh, experiences early on. And so I, I, I don't know why, but I quickly, I mean, I just took to speakers as my main interest pretty quickly pretty early on and I'd already been building speakers actually since around 13 or so uh, but not knowing what I was doing you're just kind of learning and experimenting and playing around which is a good way to start out uh, then I went to work for a, kind of a, a local speaker manufacturer I grew up in Norman Oklahoma where the University of Oklahoma is and um, uh, there was a speaker company there and they were doing pretty well but they were small and small enough to where you could get involved in it and and I kind of quickly, and that was pretty interesting, but I quickly realized that I would never be a good speaker designer unless I got an engineering degree and really learned the, the scientific basis of, of what's actually happening, you know, because uh, you can't go as far as I wanted to go with just with anecdotal knowledge and playing around. So anyway, so that's what, uh, you know, if you fast forward to about, I, so that was um, in the mid-70s. Uh, by 78, I was literally designing speakers, you know, uh, in, a, in a calculated fashion from an engineering standpoint. <clears throat> I did work for a number of other people, and um, but it, it was still mainly kind of for fun. It was a business, but I had a day job. Maybe what's more relevant is by the, by the late 80s, I was already kind of getting sick of box speakers. I could, you know, you can tell that there's something fundamentally different about the way box speakers sound from real music uh, or some big source like the magnet planers that I had been around. And I, I view that as there's something wrong, and I don't know exactly what it is. We know obviously there's certain things going on with cabinet resonances and things, but uh, I think what bothered me was the experience was felt wrong or something. It was different. And um, so that at that point in about 88, I basically just switched over full time to try to figure out what the hell's going on with uh, with speaker with box speakers and going looking at open baffle uh, back at that time. But the problem, or one of the problems back in those days in the late 80s, early 90s, there, there wasn't really any information about it. It wasn't until the guy at um, Gradient uh, loudspeakers in Finland, maybe the first 
company or the first guy that did some research on this and really sort of put some scientific backbone into it. And that was about 1991 before I found out about what he had uh, written. And so gradually through the 90s, there became more and more information when people were starting to realize that this has a lot of promise and benefit. Nobody really commercialized it in a way that audiophiles would really know about it. Um, and then Linkwitz came along, you know, and really started opening up the field. Uh, did a lot of mathematics behind it and was con- for sure, you know, convinced that it was a better approach than box readers. So, but during that period in the mid to late nineties, I went to work for a, a, a big pro, you know, professional audio type company uh, that made thousands of speakers, 25, 30,000 speakers a year. And I was the director of engineering there. So I was in a, again, in a kind of a lucky situation because I really wasn't prepared for what I was going to see. And that was that what they're looking at and what they're testing for and what they're developing around in terms of concepts is very different than what I was used to in the consumer home audiophile kind of world. And quickly realized again that, you know, there's something completely missing here from what I was used to in the audiophile world. So long story short, you know, from there, I, I eventually started producing loudspeakers. This company, Emerald Physics, that I had started, we, we finally, after all that time, produced a production serial product called the CS2 in 2007. Hmm. Um, and it was qu- quite popular, you know, because it wasn't really heavily promoted or anything, but there was a lot of word of mouth that became very popular. Um, but it required a, an outboard DSP controller in order to work, and I obviously didn't like that. So it sounded really good, but there were some weaknesses in the general uh, approach that I took, I think, uh, which I later were, was able to rectify with the spatial brand. We came, came right out of the shoot with the idea that we can do this passively, um, plug and play if we design our own drivers and do it from the ground up from scratch. So that's really what spatial was about. It's about finally commercializing the potential uh, that that open baffle had. But backing up just a second, the uh, uh, pro audio experience that I had with all the testing, we had a, we had a big laboratory. We had eight development engineers. We had all these people working on all kinds of things. And we just, I just learned a lot of stuff um, that I would, there's no way I would have known otherwise. And um, it's, it's normal stuff in the pro market, but, you know, there's not much cross, we'll say it that way, there's not much cross fertilization between home and, and pro. Um, so anyway, that's kind of, so sp- Spatial kind of gave me a, a platform to say, okay, here's the most modern way that I can think of all of these things that I've learned and try to integrate them into a product to where um, it does all these things that I want to do, but it's a practical product. It's not weird. It's not huge. It's not expensive. It's not, doesn't require special amplification or, you know, so that a, a, a regular guy that has a pair of speakers now could switch to it and it would be a seamless transition to get the benefits of this, uh, this approach. That's interesting because I've been in, you know, audiophile or let's just say a music enthusiast uh, since around the late seventies, and I hadn't really heard of Open Baffle. I heard of Linquist, and I, you know, I had some knowledge of it, but whenever I went to shop for a speaker or listen and audition a speaker, it was never on my list. In fact, I was fortunate enough to meet you a few years ago um, when your M threes came out, and I had started hearing about Open Baffle, and I thought. You know, there was one situation that I had when I was uh, younger, when I was helping my mentor build his speakers. We actually had a driver that had blown and we were replacing the driver in the cabinet. And he said to me, and I was like the apprentice, right? So he said, hey, hook it up and let's just make sure it works. So I took it out of the cabinet, I hooked it up and I listened to it. And I said, that sounds pretty good. And so then we said, okay, driver's good. Let's install it and mount it in in the cabinet. We mounted it in the cabinet and we played it. And I said, wait a minute, it sounded a lot better when it was out of the cabinet. And I was 21 years old, you know, very green in audio, just learning, trying to absorb everything. He said, well, you're right, but it's really hard to execute that design. And so when I was looking for a speaker a couple of years ago, I reached out to you and I said, I've never heard your speaker, but I'm really intrigued by the design philosophy and what the potential is. And I recalled my earlier experience in 1980, and this was just like three and a half years ago or so. 
and I took a gamble and I got the speakers and I was just couldn't believe how open and dynamic they were and to your point they just fit right in my system I didn't have to do anything but set them up yeah yeah and that's really that, that's one of the things is all of us that go to audio shows probably would agree on is that the, so much of the gear is, is one or more of the following it's extremely expensive extremely uh, large or unsuitable or you know or uh, to put in your house so I, so it, in some ways, it's just not that interesting to me to say, well, this, you know, a hundred thousand dollar speaker ought to sound pretty dang good, right? If you if you had that much money to put into parts and this that and the other, but it doesn't seem this is one industry where there just doesn't seem to be really any correlation between price, size, uh, design, anything. That all kinds of speakers can sound good or bad, and it, there's just all over the map, and you don't see that in other industries. Uh, like look at look at cell phones for example. If you took an, an LG and an Apple iPhone and a, and a Samsung, they're different, but they're almost exactly the same. I mean, and because of competition. But in loudspeakers, uh, it's not like that at all. And I think part of that is, is there's a, there's, it's heavily based on bias, like what the designer believes it should sound like, uh, it, as opposed to some sort of scientific standards or angle towards uh, the designer's uh, own ideas and how he feels about things and how they sound. Um, that's not really good in a, in the, from a scientific standpoint. It's better to get some kind of uh, some solid consensus on the way things ought to be done. But in my case, I'm happy that it's that way because uh, the speaker industry, you know, it gives me an opportunity to uh, stand out because the when you think about, it, if you go back, all of us probably remember, let's say, like the, the large Advent, for example, sure, uh, or a JBL forty four eleven or whatever it was called, or things throughout the years that that we liked back then. You know, I mean, I liked those products. Um, I actually had the smaller Advents. Yeah, right. Very. Yeah, and, and of course you could go up and down the decades and talk about speakers that stood out, the Spica. TC50, the Dolphus EQ10s, all these different, the Dynaco A25, mm -hmm. the Anderson uh, 2C, and all of those products have, um, it actually might be interesting to study why they became popular, like really study it, you know, as to what's really going on there, but one of the things that struck me, though, as a lot of the decades went by is that nothing was really happening. Um, if you go back right now and look at a can't think of the perfect example, but um, you just take an Advent. It had a low-grade kind of tweeter in it. Yes. But when, when you get right down to it, things really haven't changed very much since then. Drivers have definitely gotten better, but there were good drivers back then. The Dynaudio Isotar tweeter uh, is would still be considered a fantastic tweeter. Um, and the and it, I don't know when it came out, but I'm going to say. 1982 or something. I mean, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. Con considering it's almost 2020, so so uh, when you think about that, and you say that teal small parameters uh, defined how a box alignment should be set up, and that was back in the 80s. Then what's really happened since the 80s? Um, and, and to me, that's unacceptable. I guess is the way I kind of look at it. Um, I don't want to just go to stores and go to shows and just basically hear some regurgitation of the same thing over and over again. Now, there certainly were things like refinement and uh, sophistication and um, engineering modeling. All these things have come into play that have made speakers better. But the Achilles heel in mind is just personally, you know, just what, the way I look at it. It doesn't mean it's necessarily right. But the, what stands out as the constant in all of this mediocrity, if you want to call it that, is the fact that they're all boxes. They, they, and they sound like it. Um, even if they get quite expensive, they still sound like boxes. You're, you're not fooled. You know, you don't think, oh, that's a live event. This just doesn't, you know, so um, that, that after a while becomes a pet peeve. The more you listen, in fact, a lot of customers, you know, uh, we sold thousands of pairs of, the, of that one model that you had, you know, the M3. And, and the common comment um, is that they, they didn't realize that they, how boxy the speaker was while, while they owned it. 
it's when they heard another speaker, like an open baffle speaker, then they realized, oh, or a horn speaker, they realized how different what they were listening to, you know, versus music, live music. And so, um, so people that I, that, that tell me that my own customers that, that have bought speakers, uh, they all have a kind of a similar, uh, response. And that is, I wish I'd have known about this a long time ago, or, you know, in other words, I didn't realize what I was listening, what I was missing. So, uh, now Magnapan owners already know that and quad owners and people like, like that, but those kinds of designs also have their own category of problems. And so as we kind of all have learned, loudspeaker design really is a matter of managing all kinds of different compromises and trade-offs and so forth. <clears throat> but you, you can talk to your blue in the face about that concept with all these trade-offs. Well, yeah, it is. But as long as you're, you're using a box, you have, it's, that's the elephant in the room, really. I mean, until you get rid of that, you, I, I think there's, it's kind of a dead end is my feeling. Uh, and, and I, and I feel that way, not only from listening, but, um, we just do every kind. We just test things all the time, and it's just so consistent uh, that open baffle sounds more natural and more realistic. It, that, to me, there's no argument anymore about it. And, and guys like Lincoln would would uh, back that up if he was still here today. But um, so to me, it's not even an open argument. Uh, but I'm willing to accept that people think it might be because it's new. You know, it's a, it's new to people anyway. Uh, most of us didn't really, like you said, you know, before maybe five, it's only been in the last, I'm going to say 10 years that really anybody has known about it much at all. But we're seeing now um, as we ramp up the sales and more and more people at Pure Audio Project are, are involved with making a really good open baffle speaker that the awareness level is what's been the problem. Um, now that there's more of them on the market, more people are talking about it. Now it's becoming a snowball effect. Now everybody's talking about it. Everybody's calling. Everybody's talking about it in the forums. So it, there's a critical mass effect where suddenly this is the thing um, when it's actually been around for a while, uh, but it was just kind of underground in a way. Maybe. Yes, I agree. Uh, you mentioned magna planar speakers, and that's an interesting speaker for me. I really find it. Um, and appreciate its ability to reproduce mid-range and pianos and guitars. Very live sounding, the presence is there, timbers right on. But when it comes to music that has more dynamic range, I'm always feeling like I'm missing something. I've had a, an opportunity that I really enjoyed listening to the Quad 57s. Um, that was just fantastic. But again, that, that nice high impact, you know, bass drum that you just feel in your chest or, you know, a timpani or you know, some real dynamic instrument that's, you know, that's happening, you know, I just don't seem to get that in those types of speakers. When I bought your speakers and I listen to your speakers, I just have, I feel like I'm getting it all. I'm feeling like the pianos are spot on, the timbers right where it needs to be. It's transparent and live sounding. You know, I get the goosebumps uh, on a beautiful piece of music. Uh, I'm there. And when the music gets more dynamic, um, you know, I get excited. It just seems to be a unique product that has it all. Yeah. Uh, well, a couple comments there. One, based on what you said at the end there, is um, is really important, and that, and I think we, everybody listening, has probably run into this too. I know I always have, and that is the, the idea of, of how balanced the product is. Uh, and I, I, the term I use is engineering balance uh, in terms of how well you chose the trade-offs and so forth, but. Um, I think it's frustrating to go around like like a, audio shows are a lot of fun. You go room to room, you listen to these different things. Of course, the room setups are not optimal and all of that. But but what's I, what I think is interesting is how so not all, but how a lot of speakers have a um, a real strong pros and cons list. In other words, it's like you know, boy, the bass is really great on the speaker, but the top end. You know, I could not live with that. It's edgy or, I mean, whatever it is, it's like, that's not really good design. A good design to me is, um, is that it's so well balanced and well tuned that you actually don't even notice the speaker. That's actually the goal is that you're looking at this image that's projected out there and it's entranced you inside. Your, you're just sort of involved in this image that you're listening to. And then you, and you're not even paying attention to the speaker. So 
so by definition, the speaker must be good because when it has um, when it has flaws and errors, like something simple like uh, frequency response anomalies, let's say there's a peak in the mid range, right? Um, that whether you like it or not, that draws attention to itself, so you notice it, and that's what we're trying to get away from. We want everything so integrated, so well done that you don't really the speaker doesn't call attention to itself. Um, so then getting back to what you said first about the dynamic range, um, if you look back through my designs, you'll see that, that that's been a constant going all the way back to that 2007 CS2 model. And I think um, that's, I guarantee you where that came from. That came from this pro, pro audio uh, design experience. And, um, and a lot of audiophiles, of course, have heard good horn speakers and you, you it brings into sharp relief how poor the dynamics are with regular speakers. And so that's a real simple thing to answer. It's not really anything that I do necessarily. It's, it's just high efficiency. High efficiency gives you a greater dynamic contrast. And um, all you have to do is go back and listen to a Clipshorn or a Paltec A7, whatever, that, you know, to get back before the acoustic suspension days. And they were, they were all dynamic because speakers were developed initially for movie theater use when we converted from silent movies they had to be extremely efficient and have control directivity patterns and so forth because they were the amplifiers were teeny tiny two watt amplifiers to, for use in an auditorium so the industry started out from a real good angle for, you know in a lot of ways um in large companies like rca and western electric were the ones developing this stuff, and they were highly scientific engineering companies uh, compared to the tiny companies we have in, in our industry. So, so you can learn a lot just by going back and hearing some of this earlier stuff. But they had a lot of now what we would call inadequacies. You know, like maybe the horn sounds harsh or whatever. But but high efficiency is one of the baseline things that has to be there. If you don't, if uh, the dynamic range is directly related to how live it sounds. Um, and even and in some ways, just as importantly, how well it, a high dynamic range, high efficiency speaker sounds better generally, all everything's equal anyway, sounds better when you turn the volume down low. And this is a real problem with regular speakers that have 87 dB sensitivity or whatever, is that they almost kind of act like a diode. They sort of have this effect where you feel like they're, they don't really turn on until you get them up to a certain volume level and they're not very useful at, at like late night listening because if you turn them down they just don't sound very good and that, that's directly related to this, this efficiency question so I've, I've made sure that uh, that's been a top priority all along but that brings a lot of challenges to the design if you want high efficiency fine but uh, to get there you have to, it's tricky uh, to get that without causing side effect problems like frequency response issues and things like that so that's well we'll get into it that's that's one of the main reasons we're using the uh, the air motion transformer driver that we're using in the x3 because that that's a professional uh, driver uh, from the pro market that's designed to play at very high spls yet at the same time it's super audiophile it's super linear super low distortion has control directivity so there's a way there's an example probably the best example i can think of really uh, to get both you know to get high efficiency and to maintain an audiophile quality performance without trading that away you know? great <clears throat> hey clayton um as i mentioned i reviewed the x3s it's my speaker that i chose i auditioned a lot of speakers i was a partner in a high-end audio dealership in the 90s and certainly have been around really high quality speakers and this is the one i chose and i'm really enjoying it can you tell us what inspired you to design and build the x3s uh sure just a few thoughts there i um every and i think you're <laughs> Our customers are almost painfully aware of every time we come out with a new design, it's it's not for marketing reasons. It's really just because we have been working and developing. And, and so it's like the newest thing is like the latest uh, design work. And it's, um, you know, it's somewhat of a, I wouldn't say an invention, but, but there's usually a lot of new things going on uh, 
with whatever the latest speaker is. But in the X3 is that way, and in the X5 by extension, it's really the same speaker. It just has a it's for smaller rooms. It has a 12 inch woofer instead of a 15 inch. But anyway, so um, the we'll, we'll just talk about the X3 because that's the one that you have. Um, but the we developed a, 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 a dedicated dipole 15 inch woofer. Uh, for use in that speaker called the SD15. Um, that driver really turned out better than I had ever dreamed. It it's a really uh, performs extremely well, and it's more importantly, it sounds good. Uh, it, it just sounds uh, the plumpness and the, the, the speed of this thing just sounds very natural to me. So, so anyway, the, the the overall concept of the X3 was to say, look, if we um, if we took the base, the pressure of reproducing the base off of the speaker and off of the amplifier, we could really uh, up the game here a lot, um, which is exactly what you see in pro audio where speakers are powered active. Um, there's a lot of benefits to it, but uh, the realistic thing, though, is that in the audiophile market, audiophiles generally will not buy um, powered speakers. There are a few here and there like ATC, but they're virtually none. Um, and and it's really a has to do with mid and treble. They're concerned about having D to A converters in the treble and what is their what does the built in amp sound like? I had I, my amp's way better and all this kind of thing, which is perfectly valid, you know. So but when it comes to bass, those kinds of questions aren't really an issue. Um, it's not like well you know, I'm worried about how my amp, the, like we use a real high-end, uh, high-dex in-core uh, power amp that drives the bass section. And I can't imagine somebody questioning how good that thing sounds for, for just bass use, right? So so there's an opportunity to build kind of a hybrid approach where, um, and I'm certainly not the first one to do it, but so the, where the woofer is powered and then the mid-range and treble are passive, there's a passive crossover between the mid and the treble, um, you pick up a lot of advantages in terms of dynamic speed control. And when we say speed, we don't mean that you know sound travels at the speed it travels at. What we're talking about is how fast the driver can can start up, accelerate, and then decelerate back to its its zero position. And that is kind of um, the way to look at that is I don't know. There's a lot of analogies, but one would be the guy driving his car down the highway or to, around town uh, and his shocks are worn out. And every time he gets a bump, his, his car, uh, you know, it goes up, but it doesn't really come down. It kind of takes a while. It's lazy. And then it goes back up again. It's just kind of this oscillating um, kind of thing. And um, the, that's, that would be poor transient response or what we call a slow speaker because what it's not settling. And once you, put a stimulus on a, on a emissive diaphragm like that. You want it to stop and then st or start and then stop after it reproduces the waveform as quickly as possible. And there's, it's, there's no way to do it perfectly, but um, that's, that's what it gives you when we say tight bass or fast bass. It just means it, it has a fast settling time. And um, fortunately, that's one of the main benefits of, of an open baffle speaker is that you don't have the box creating this resonant behavior that causes that, that trailing out effect of that long resonant ringing tail. So you, do, you get a much better uh, stopping uh, speed. So anyway, so that's even enhanced quite a bit when you can direct drive it. If you can hook a power amp directly to the driver and not have to go through large inductors um, that you use in a crossover, um, in a passive crossover, um, that effect that you hear of being tight and dynamic is is much much better. It's very anybody can hear it. <clears throat> so that's why a lot of that's why designers love um, powered bass. And, and just look at subwoofers. Uh, you don't see passive subwoofers around. They're all active. Um, so so that's this approach where the the bass is active and upper range is, is passive is a way to kind of get best of both worlds. Um, and so what we did is we, had, we later designed a, a, tw a 12, it's, a, it's actually based on a driver that Eminence already makes. It's a 
neodymium, real high performance mid range driver that's a 12 inch unit. And we uh, worked with them to create a dipolar, you know, optimized version of it. Um, and it's pretty cool because it, the thing just is so quick. I mean, it, it's very, very light, even though it's large, right? So it, it has this same kind of effect in the mid range. So it's very transparent. You feel like there's no hangover. It's stop start, very high acceleration. Okay, so so you can see there's a theme here going up the frequency range. The, the whole speaker is really kind of based around the whole the same thing, the same uh, ideas, and which are really acceleration. Um, yeah, so then, like I mentioned earlier, that that air motion transformer that's made by Bema in Spain is a unique device uh, that we're using for travel because there are certainly other air motion transformers becoming very popular in the market because they, it's now a commodity Chinese kind of mass production device. But this isn't like this is not that. This is a a, a high efficiency, <clears throat> high output device that covers a broader range than a than a tweeter does. So. So when you're using large drivers, like if you're going to use a 12-inch or 15-inch, like in this case, the mid-range is a 12-inch driver, you need a, a low crossover point. You have to, otherwise it'll start, the response will start beaming and become directional, uh, as well as you'll get distortion out of the cone. You'll get uh, all kinds of issues, uh, plus more Doppler distortion and so forth. But So if you look at our designs going all the way back, we generally always have a crossover point of 1,000 hertz or lower. You do that, you sidestep a whole bunch of problems uh, because that's your ear is still sensitive in that range. But when you get up to that two two kilohertz and up range, your ear is really sensitive to the idea of switching over from a mid range to a tweeter or from a woofer to a tweeter. And I I found that it's best not to do that. That if you can cross over at a thousand or less, then you have the entire upper half of the spectrum coming out of one single diaphragm. And that's a that gives you a lot of that coherence that you wish you still when you wish you still had your quad fifty sevens. It's it, you get a lot of that. It's like it's more one piece, um, and it's also in the same space. You know, in the same three dimensional space, it's a true point source. So uh, that's that's why we do it that way. Now the without the Bema being available it would be difficult to pull off the X3 with that, without that AMT driver because it's very similar in the sense it's very, very efficient, very dynamic, and very clean sounding. So when you put them all together, if you integrate them correctly together, then you get what I like to call, which may sound weird to some people, but is essentially like a, a very large uh, studio monitor with no, with no box. That's really what this thing is. Uh, it's super fast, super dynamic, super clean, uh, but no box effects. Uh, that's really the crux of what th that, that series, the X3 and the X5, really are to me. That makes a pretty good combination, I must say. Um, one question, kind of listening to you talk about the X3, is if I look back in my audio file history, and I, I look back where it started back in the late 70s, I had a friend that I was close to that I was over their house all the time, and, and of course their father was an audiophile. And he had <clears throat> Jansen electrostatic um, high end, and he had a nice mid-range, and he had 15-inch Hartleys, and he actually mounted them in the wall, and of course he had the finest tube amps of the day, and he used to take all the stuff to the stereo doctor, and of course this was awfully exciting for someone that just loved music as I did. So I tried to learn a lot from him, but I remember the sound of those 15 inch drivers and the sound of the bass. And all throughout my time buying speakers, you know, I never really thought I you know, lived up to the sound that I had heard, you know, even at 18, 19 years old, right? Um, it just seems like the bigger the woofer, like these X3s have a 15 inch driver, um, there's a different sound in the bass with a larger woofer. Um, and it's just, to me, more fuller, more richer, more harmonic. I know that um, designs will vary, right? But can you comment on that at all? Yeah, well, that's, uh, yeah, there's, that's complex enough to, to try to unpack that in a, in a couple sentences. I don't think I'll try, but 
uh, remember, you, you have an open baffle 15 inch, so not a, a 15 inch worker in a box or in a wall. So, so there's a lot of differences there. But what I find, uh, and this again is just my own personal experience, but when I walk around shows, I consistently don't like speakers that have small woofers uh, that are moving a lot. Um, I think the the long, I think this this uh, high excursion small diaphragm thing just uh, it may measure fine, it may have a number of attributes like it's small, but I don't like the sound of it, and it may be the the amount of pressure change going on in the box being so rapid because the driver's having to move more. If you made the driver twice as large, it wouldn't be moving as much, and it wouldn't be so much change. Uh, and so that's number one. Number two is the Doppler distortion. Well, that means uh, most people kind of know what that is, but in a speaker, it's really, really important. It's it's like if you have a if you have a a bass tone. Let's just take just a sine wave generator. We just have a sine wave, and you put 40 hertz through it, and the speaker's sitting there going like that. Okay, and and, and it's moving a certain amount because at 40 hertz, it's, it's got to move a fair amount to, to reproduce that. So, and then on the same woofer, at the same time, we have a second generator or second channel in the generator that puts a one kilohertz signal through the same driver so that, that there's two tones coming out of it at the same time. Well, the, the problem that instantly occurs, and it's a serious problem, I think, is that the one kilohertz signal mid-range signal is a real tiny, in uh, you know, a relatively tiny amount of movement, and it's a higher pitch. And what happens is it's riding, you're generating this high pitch, higher pitch signal on the surface of a device that's moving, okay? The, the woofer's moving to reproduce this 40 hertz or 20 hertz or whatever signal, <clears throat> and the uh, this higher tone is attached to it. So, so what it sounds like is a warbling effect. It's a pitch bending thing where it's changing the pitch back and forth as it goes in and out so we want we want we like that hmm. um and you don't you don't hear it in in that way because you're not sitting around listening to individual test tones but that's what doppler distortion is um so as much as you can you want to de depending on what you're trying to do with the design you want to try to minimize the amount of cone movement and um the expo show that i went to i saw a number of of speakers that were very like over two hundred thousand dollars that had little four inch woofers that were just just crazy moving around uh and i'm thinking well now if you cross them over real low and you didn't allow higher tones to go through it that's that's okay but um even then there's still something that doesn't sound right about that to me and i think again it's the high excursion in a box is a problem in terms of uh just the compression change effect in the box maybe in an open baffle i don't notice that uh but we still try to minimize that uh like the the crossover point on the x3 on that woofer is 90 hertz right so there isn't any one kilohertz signal going through it's like you would expect in a three-way that's you know you you set that's one of the reasons you separate the, the ranges but um but anyway uh the but i think it comes it's, it's, it is quite noticeable in our mid-range driver because it's a three-way, so there's no base coming out of it. The mid-range driver is large. It doesn't really move at all. Um, so it's not uh, not creating any Doppler effects to speak of. So uh, all speakers have Doppler distortion. It's a matter of managing it and trying to minim minimize it as much as possible. But in a three-way, definitely helps in that regard. Um, but a three-way introduces a bunch of new problems. So the whole thing is a big bag of trouble to try to figure out, you know, the best way to do all this stuff. And this, this is what I got to get into that earlier is that preference comes into this a lot and methodology. Like if, if your measurement rig and the way you measure things and the things that you identify as important factors, let's like maybe you think that Doppler distortion is like number two on your list. The way that you rank all these various uh, issues to deal with has a lot to do with the way the speaker ends up sounding. Because um, somebody else might not worry about that. They may be worried about something else. And, and so that I think that in some regard accounts for why speakers seem to sound so much different, along with the fact that people just have preferences. And, and, and designers think their speakers sound better than they do usually. If you talk to them, they're more excited than anybody else. Because 
this thing just signed him. It's like, you know, and everybody else is like, yeah, it's pretty good. But <laughs> exactly. I think it's the greatest thing ever. And I think it's normal. There's nothing wrong with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, a lot of hard work goes under that. Right. Well, Clayton, it's been a fascinating conversation. Really enjoyed having you on Audio Talk. And I really hope uh, we can invite you back again and have another uh, go at it. Yeah, thank you, Bill. I enjoyed uh, talking with you and be happy to come back anytime. time. And we'll leave the audience with a song, and they can hear it uh, recorded through the Spatial Audio X3s. Enjoy that, and everyone have a great day. Until next time, thank you for tuning in to Audio Talk. Got to me first, it ate me up, then it set me free. One day.